for our last lesson, accenting the teachings of Jesus, we're looking not at several sermons, but at one long talk that Jesus has with his disciples. It's in John 13 through 17. Jesus is speaking to the apostles after the Last Supper. It is, in a way, his uh, farewell message. Of course, there'll still be time very soon when he'll be with them in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they'll see him at the cross. But for his normal human life, this will be the last great speech that he makes to his apostles before his resurrection, when, of course, he'll speak to them again. In chapter 13, we see the very personal scene, and what we see developing is Jesus preparing the disciples for his departure from this world, which is imminent. As we said, the occasion is the end of the Last Supper. He's finished the Last Supper. And John tells us something that the others don't. That Jesus gets up from the table and takes off his clothes that he would wear to a special dinner, wraps a towel around his waist, and goes to wash the disciples' feet. They, of course, are uneasy with this, and as you know, Peter objects to it, but Jesus puts him in his place. And he tells them, if I have washed your feet, you ought to be serving one another in the same way. At this time, he also talks about the one who will betray him. And he tells Judas, evidently, quietly, he tells Judas what you have to do. Do it quickly. He tells them that he's going away to a place where they cannot come. And when Peter says, I'll go with you anywhere, he predicts Peter's denial. Then he gives this beautiful message in chapters 14 and 15 and 16. The chapters are intertwined, but they break down somewhat this way. Chapter 14 describes how God is going to provide for the apostles in the troubles that are soon to come. Chapter 15 tells how God intends for the disciples to unify in the face of the world's hatred. And in the 16th chapter, he pulls it together, declaring that he has overcome the world. Finally, the 17th chapter is an extended, beautiful prayer of Jesus for his disciples. Looking more closely at John chapter 14, as we've just observed, Jesus has been bringing it more and more to their attention that he's about to be taken away. And so he starts out with beautiful words. You may have heard them at a funeral, but this is Jesus talking to his disciples after the Last Supper, when he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it weren't so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, 
I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. You know the way where I'm going. So he starts off to give them comfort by saying, I am going away, a soft way of presenting what is about to happen. And he tells them to have faith in God and faith in Jesus and to count on it that he's going to eventually take them to live in heaven with him. But when he says, you know the way where I'm going, he leaves an opening for expressions of confusion and doubt. Knowing what else we know about Thomas, we see him as doubting. Verse 5 tells us, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? To which Jesus answers a phrase that virtually all Christians know well. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then he makes a bold statement of his identity with the Father. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Notice what wonderful claims he's making as he gives them this comfort to be held when they face his crucifixion and his death and his departure to return to heaven. Don't be troubled. I'm going to make a place for you and I'm going to come get you. And you know where I'm going. Thomas says, no, I don't. And Jesus says, I am the way. I'll take you to the Father. And then he makes these amazing claims. You have seen the Father when you've seen me. Now, he says that more, or he says that again when another one speaks up. Philip is more positive in his response to what Jesus has said. He says, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. But Jesus wants to pull him deeper to a truer appreciation of who Jesus is. And so he says, have I been with you so long and you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. So he reassures them that he is connecting them with the Father forever, even though he's going on and leaving them behind for now. Secondly, he provides them comfort in knowing that a helper is coming to them. He's sending the Holy Spirit. Now, first of all, he identifies who he's talking about in verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. His followers, the ones who love him, are the ones who obey him. But then he introduces this new information. And I will ask the Father, and he will send you another helper to be with you forever. This word helper is a word put to special use in reference to the Holy Spirit. Helper is a good translation, but the Greek word paraclete is one who is called to be by your side, one who, who's standing right there with you, and, and who's there to support you. And so 
he identifies this helper as the spirit of truth that only the people who belong to Jesus can receive. He tells them in verse uh, 17 that they know this Holy Spirit, even though he's introducing to them who it is, says he dwells with you and will be in you. Could be that he's saying and that's a continuation, he will be in you, or it could be, and I think this is indicated in the book of Acts, that in an even more special way, the Spirit will dwell inside you. And then verse 18 is beautiful the way he puts it. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. But he wants them to know what's coming. Yet a little while, the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. He's preparing them for something that they'll appreciate after the resurrection. They'll come to believe that they're going with Jesus to heaven once they see that Jesus is raised from the dead. And he says, in that day, that is, when they know through the resurrection, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. A beautiful thought to ponder. A theme that he's now introducing, unity, based in the unity of the Father and the Son. Moving on down to verse 26, again about the helper. He gives a very specific blessing to the apostles. The helper, the Holy Spirit, whom God the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Without belittling the truth that the Bible says, that it's, it's right for a Christian to be led by the Spirit. I think we need to take this verse in its particular context. He says some very specific blessings. In particular, that he will remind them of all that Jesus said to them. This is not a blessing that can be directly applied to me or to anyone else on earth today because Jesus does not speak to us the way he spoke to the apostles while he was living on earth. What I believe Jesus is doing is reassuring them that you can carry on the mission after I'm gone. You're going to have this special blessing of the Holy Spirit so that you'll know what I've said. You'll know everything you need to know. And then he pronounces such a blessing on them, starting in verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And then he puts it in their particular situation. He says, what is bothering you that I'm leaving? It's really something to be happy about. Rejoice with me. I'm rejoining the Father, the Father who is greater than I am. But he goes back to the warning. The reason he's having to reassure them is because it's about to get very bad. He says, before it all takes place, I want you to know what's going to happen. And then he says something that you have to think through it to know what he's talking about. It. He says in verse 30, I'm not going to talk much with you anymore. The ruler of this world is coming but that's not in a good way. The devil who rules worldly people. 
Then he reassures them, he has no claim on me. And he takes them back to the sad news of what's about to happen. But I do as the Father commanded me, so that the world may know I love the Father. So here in the 14th chapter, he's given them warnings and reassurance. He's pointed them to heaven, but he's told them about the really bad things that are about to happen. And then they move on to some other location. And he gives them the lesson that starts in chapter 15. He talks about staying, that he will come back to them, that he's not abandoning them. In chapter 15, he begins talking about their staying with him, or more specifically, in him. And he uses the example of a, of a vine and its branches, and the branches can stay alive while they're attached to the vine, but you break off the branches and, and there's no vitality in them. They're certainly not going to produce any fruit disconnected from the vine. And so he says, in that sense, we must understand that we must stay connected to him to be productive as his followers. And he says that his disciples glorify the Father if they stay in him, stay in Christ, abide in Christ, and are very productive, produce much fruit. Look at verses uh, four and five. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch can't bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is who bears much fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. He goes on to talk about glorifying God by bearing much fruit. And then he says, look, here's the reason I'm giving you this talk. In verse 11, these things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. He knows that they're going to be heartbroken, but he has the joy of knowing he's going to the Father and doing the Father's will. And so he wants them to know his joy. Then he brings up an important theme that will be carried out throughout the rest of this talk and the prayer to follow. In verse 12, he says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. He is not only saying, I've loved you, love one another. He says, as I have loved you, because he goes on to give the example of what is the greatest love a person can have for another. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Knowing as a reader what's about to happen, you can't miss that he's talking about what he's doing. So he's preparing them for his crucifixion by saying, it's the greatest thing your friend can do, the greatest love he can show to lay his life down for you. And he says, you are my friends, not just my servants, you're my friends. I came down so you'd know what the Father had to say, and I've told you, and you know what the Father says. You're my friends, and I chose you. Then he repeats, these things I command that you love one another. And then he provides a warning. In contrast to the love that his followers are to have for one another, his followers need to be prepared for the hate that comes from worldly people. 
If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. And he goes on to explain, you who are following me, you're not worldly people. You're not of the world. That's why they hate you. And I told you a servant isn't above his master. So if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you too. Then in verse 23, he provides perspective. Whoever hates me hates my father also. And then he talks about the fact that they've seen the works. They know this is from heaven and they still hate him and his father. He says, that's a fulfillment of the Old Testament law. They hated me without a cause. Jesus returns to building them up, to preparing them to be courageous enough to go on after he returns to heaven. He brings up again the helper, the spirit of truth. He says that helper is going to bear witness about me. And then you're going to do that too. He'll come back to this thing in the next chapter. In the end of the chapter, he's going to say, I have overcome the world. But he starts with where they are. Again, he repeats, here's why I'm telling you this. It's to keep you from falling away. I know how hard it's going to be. I know you're going to grieve. I know that people are going to put you down, run you out of the synagogues. There's coming a time when they'll even think they're serving God if they kill you. But that's because they haven't known the Father. They haven't known Jesus. So I want you to know what's coming. And you don't fall away because you're surprised that it came. And then he goes talking about how they're going to go on without him. Reminds them in verse 5. Now I am going to him who sent me. And I know that saying this puts sorrow in your hearts. So he returns to the one he's sending, to the helper. That helper, the Holy Spirit, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And if the disciples are wondering how they can go on without Jesus with them, the way they remember him with him, then he says, look, the spirit of truth that is coming. He's going to guide you into all the truth. I, have, I can't tell you everything now. You can't take it all now. But he will. He will guide you into all the truth. In particular, he will convict the world of sin and he will judge the ruler of this world, meaning worldly people, he will put Satan in his place. And then he tells them how they're going to turn back to joy. He gives them a saying that they don't appreciate. A little while and you will see me no longer. Get a little while and you will see me. And they say, oh, what's he talking about? And he recognizes that and says, you're trying to understand what, what I mean? Well, here it is, verse 20. You will weep and lament while worldly people are rejoicing. You'll be sorrowful. But your sorrow will turn into joy. You have to feel for those followers who are so close to him, who had not seen what we know will happen. He's leaving them, but he's telling them, 
when he comes back and they had not understood about coming back on the third day, there'll be such joy. He talks about there will be a tough time like a woman's in labor, but look at what wonderful life comes from that. So in verse 22, he reassures them again. So also, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. And your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. He keeps it real in verse 28. He, he wants them to know this is, this is ending and something better is coming. Verse 28, I came from the Father and I've come into the world and now I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. They get it. They in their heads at least, believe it. Jesus knows they're going to run away when it gets really, really bad. But he's given this message to them so that when it's all over, when the terrible times are over, they'll have peace. Listen to these beautiful last words of his speech. I've said these things to you, that in me, you may have peace. In the world, you have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. I want to take just a moment to look at some highlights from the beautiful prayer that Jesus praise with them. And it's the last thing we see from this speech before Jesus is about to head for Gethsemane and be arrested and go through that awful week. Those awful few days. It's a prayer of sanctification. To be sanctified is to be completely devoted to it's almost, the imagery is like a ceremony where you are dedicated to someone. That's what he prays for his people. Jesus prays to his Father, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. This is a prayer where Jesus is the go-between from his followers to the Father. He has made known to them who God is. I have manifested your name. And he speaks of them in a term that elevates them. These are the people that you, God, gave me out of the world. And then he says, I've given them words that you gave me. And this prayer is for them. Not praying for the world. But for those whom you've given me. Because they are yours. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you've given me. They may be one, even as we are. Are one. Keep them in your name. Once followers come to know who God is through Christ, God plays a role in keeping them abiding in Him. And then the rest of the prayer revolves around the unity. He had given the commandment that the disciples be unified. Now he's praying about that unity and carrying it to a deeper and deeper level of unity like God and Christ and with God and Christ. He prays that they may be one even as we, meaning the Son and the Father, are one. 
he more than once mentions that this connection is through the message, through God's word. I have given them your word. And the world's hated them because they're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. He knows their situation, and yet he knows that it's important for his followers to stay here. I don't ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And then he prays for this sanctification, this complete dedication. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And then he states their mission. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. Surely when Jesus speaks of his consecration, his holy giving of himself, he's speaking of the cross. And then there's this beautiful section that you and I can relate to. In that prayer, on that sad day, Jesus prays, I do not ask for these only, the apostles, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's you. It can be you. And that's me. So what is his prayer for the believers? That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus prayed a special prayer for those of us who come to believe through the words of the New Testament, that we be unified not just a little bit unified, as unified as God and Jesus. Together in him, all bound together. And he says that's necessary for the world to believe that God sent Jesus. He says, the glory that you've given to me, I've given to them so that they may be one even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, even as you loved me. That departing prayer of Jesus for us who would come to believe not only challenges us to be united, but tells us that the way to get there is to be completely identified with Christ and his glory. And to the extent that we can lay aside self, and be reflections of Christ, united with Christ, and let our differences dissolve into insignificance. Then the world can come to believe in who Jesus is and recognize us as the ones that he loves. We have one more set of lessons and that is, to me, the most sacred part of the Gospels. The horrible arrest, interrogation, torture, crucifixion, burial of Jesus. Followed 
in the marvelous light of his resurrection. That'll bring us through the end of the Gospels. <laughs>